So let's simply begin with a with a bit of a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. Lord, it is truly right and just. Heavenly Father, that we come before you in a spirit now of thanksgiving for the gifts that you have showered upon us during our life. Help us in a spirit of gratitude to recognize you as the giver of all that is good, that you have given us such an abundance of gifts to share with one another, to share with your people in need, and through your gifts to come to you, the giver of all good. Help us now to recognize you in your works, but more importantly, to step beyond your works, your gifts, to embrace you, to be embraced by you, the giver of all good. Help us to know you and to see you as the fulfillment of all our desire, of all of our longing, in which all of our ministry, our relationships, all of the things that we hold and have held dear in this life, will come together and be fulfilled in you. So with a spirit of gratitude and a spirit of eager anticipation for the fullness of your life, we come before you with humble and open hearts. Open our hearts that we may, each of us, receive the gift that you have in store for us in this time of retreat, so that coming closer to you, we may recognize you more and more as the fulfillment of all of our desire. We make this prayer in the power of the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 The thought that was occurring to me as I was struggling with preparing this retreat and what to, you know, what I can share with you uh, from my own experience. It's one particular experience that I had, uh, and it was when I went to Claremont, Our Lady of Assumption Church in Claremont, California, which is um, out. It's, it's the last outpost of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles before you get into the Diocese of San Bernardino. Uh, if you've ever driven along the, the 10 freeway, it's um, where they always have a bunch of accidents there around Indian Hill. And uh, uh, right above it is the majestic Mount San Antonio, also known as Old Baldy. And so it was a wonderful time to be there in the uh, uh, well, almost every season was just really wonderful there. In that parish, Our Lady of Assumption, uh, within a few blocks, actually right across the street and in the property adjacent to us, to the west, are two immense religious centered retirement communities. Um, one and, and they have you know, the, the full spectrum from um, uh, independent living, uh, little cottages, bungalows for individuals or couples, apartments, uh, assisted living, and skilled nursing care, at all of them. And then down the street, about half a mile down the street, is another very large one. Uh, Claremont Manor is the one right next to us, across the street from us, was uh, Pilgrim Place, and down the street was uh, San Antonio Gardens. 
Mount San Antonio Gardens. Um, Claremont Manor was started by the uh, United Methodists. Um, and Mount San Antonio Gardens was started by the United Church of Christ, the, the um, uh, UCC, they call themselves now. Uh, and the one across the street was also started by the United Church of Christ, but uh, was specifically for uh, retired religious. Now, what that meant for them, of course, was Protestant <coughs> foreign missionaries. Um, they didn't really that much consider, back in those days, Catholics to be Christians, maybe not even religious, but uh, Protestant foreign missionaries and their wives. Um, since then, things have broadened a bit, and there's a number of Catholics there. In fact, uh, uh, a number of, of retired Catholic uh, religious, as well as there have been a few Catholic priests couple of former Catholic priests there too, actually, and I was on the admissions committee during my time, part of my time as, as pastor there, and it was at that time that they broadened, the, uh, uh, broadened their residence requirements. You still had to be, have been a professional Christian uh, religious worker or uh, the major part of your life uh, in order to be admitted there. So it's not just ministers anymore, but uh, uh, the big debate, of course, whether, and, th and this came up over and over again, whether Mormons were Christians, because their theology is somewhat strange, and uh, uh, debatable as to just exactly whether they profess something compatible with a tr tr traditional Christian faith. I don't know where they are now. But when I first came, they don't have this up anymore. They took it down at some point very quietly. But at the main entrance to Pilgrim Place was a plaque, a bronze plaque, that said, Heaven's Waiting Room. And uh, I don't know, that said something to me about retirement. That said something to me about uh, the, the last task that we have, which is not just to get to heaven, but to conclude our earthly journey on the way to eternal life. And that journey always includes others. Uh, you know, it's not like we do a life of, of ministry and service uh, in order to get to heaven, and then when we can't do that anymore, we can concentrate on getting to heaven. It is a matter more, I think, the, the, the better image is probably that we all have different roles in a pilgrimage that everybody is making, that we all are making. And how do we, throughout the whole of that journey, how do we support one another with eternal life in our sight? That is our goal. I'll be reflecting a little bit on just what eternal life might mean as we are approaching that goal in this, shall we say, the twilight of life, or the, the last stage of our journey, or, or heaven's waiting room. Um, so thank you for sharing uh, what has brought you to this point, this uh, time of, of uh, these particular years that you are continuing to live and fulfilling your life as a, as a sister of Nazareth. And in that image of heaven's waiting room, uh, that question that we have, 
to keep coming back to what are we waiting for? Um, what is eternal life? And I'll be talking more about that, as I said, but one, one little reflection that I want to make on it right now is any concept that we have, any image that we have from art, from literature, from poetry, even from scripture, is totally inadequate. Um, you know, when we're talking about the reality of God, um, even the most profound revelation in scripture has to be expressed in inadequate human words and concepts. So, nothing that we can think about now uh, is adequate to express what will await us as we cross that threshold. And so that's, um, to my mind, one of the best ways of thinking about and being humble about um, this whole idea of getting to heaven. So, uh, one image that I read about just today, and I've got to go back to that article and uh, kind of reread it and get a little bit more to it, but he reflected on, and it was in the light of the scripture today, reflected on eternal life as the end of waiting. Our lives today, our lives through this life, are characterized by waiting. Waiting for this, waiting for that. Uh, waiting for the present moment to pass, for the future moment to come. And what could eternal life possibly be or be like? And he said, think about it perhaps as the end of waiting and what that would mean, whatever it is we could be waiting for, that waiting is now finished. So let's think about that, and I, I may be returning to that from time to time during, uh, during this week. Uh, we talked about, you talked about, the ministry that has brought you here. I'm going to ask you to reflect a little bit during this week on what is your ministry now? Since most of you, and I think I include myself as a retired priest, even though I'm still pretty active, but most of us um, are now being served in the way that we served others mm -hmm. through the past. And is there a ministry in being served? And what does that consist in? I think I will probably devote a whole talk to this idea of ministry and what that means to us um, as <coughs> servants. So what is ministry anyhow? That, that will be something that we'll be uh, talking about. At the heart of all that we will be saying and doing, of course, is what is at the heart of our lives, and that is Jesus Christ. Uh, we're going to keep coming back to reflecting on who is he? What is he? And Jesus Christ leads us into the Trinity. And not the Trinity as a doctrine out there that we learned about in catechism and in theology, but as the God who loves us so much. And how can that Trinity be a, an expression of the life of love that God embraces us into? Um, and how could, so how can we go into the mind and heart of God? How can we go into the mind and heart of Jesus Christ, the incarnate word? And who is he for us? 
Who is he for you? Who is he for me? Who is he for us as community, as his people, us as church, and us as world? 99% um, of whom don't even seem to effectively, at least, believe in him. Even though maybe 25% say they do, but one wonders how effective that belief in him is given the behavior that we see from 99% of them. Not to cast dispersions, but <laughs> since sometimes we are included in that 99%, I suspect. Uh, personal Lord and Savior. Universal Lord and Savior. The one of the earliest traditional titles of, of Jesus Christ, the risen Christ, has been Lord and Savior. And I'm probably at some point going to reflect a little bit on just what does Lord and Savior mean. I will keep coming back to, in fact, perhaps centering on time and again, the sacraments and especially the Eucharist. And reflecting, I want to, I want to reflect on the many dimensions of, of the Eucharist. You know, so often we fight about, and Catholics even fight about, belief in the Eucharist, faith in the Eucharist, faith in the real presence, and it tends to boil down to uh, a, a word that doesn't really say very much, if you stop and think about it, but people fight about transubstantiation. Maybe that'll be about the last time you hear that word from me, because real presence goes far beyond what we mean by transubstantiation, that bread and wine become the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus Christ. Well, yes, but that's the doorway. That's not the end of our belief. And the end of our belief in the Eucharist is, well, it doesn't end. <laughs> it, it continues. And somehow or other, just, there, there we are. Um, I'll be referring to the other sacraments to reconciliation, certainly. Baptism and Confirmation, uh, well, that's what began it all for us. And of course, Sacrament of Anointing has been so much a part of your and my, in different ways, life and ministry. Um, the last thing I'm going to circle around a little bit is virtues. What, what are the virtues? that we need to maybe concentrate more on, reflect more on in this particular time of life. And uh, the one that's key to everything is humility. And so I'll be coming back to that, humility. What does that mean? Um, doesn't mean what we often think it means, I don't think. Patience is the other one that goes hand in hand with humility. Um, hand in hand with that is one that's not listed as one of the major virtues, but it pulls them together, and that's empathy. And I'll be talking about that, reflecting on that a little. And then the God-centered virtues. Our catechism used to call them the theological virtues. Well, theological sounds so theological, <laughs> meaning up there somewhere. <laughs> but these are the God-centered virtues. What, what right now, for you and for me, does faith, hope, and charity mean? And I hope, I hope to circle around on that a little bit. And all of these things I'm going to be probably interweaving and blending together, so it's not going to be like, like a classroom. Uh, to conclude, 
What I'd like to invite you to think about as you begin the retreat is to simply let the Lord lead you in prayer. Um, your retreat director is the Lord. It's not me. And so he comes to us in prayer if our prayer is one of listening. And he wants to take the initiative in our prayer, which means that we cannot barrage him with words or with concepts, with ideas. Uh, those are important. Prayer does have to have some kind of content and has to have words and so on. We need that. God doesn't need that. God sometimes has to find his way around the words that we keep throwing at him. And I don't know if you have found this, but I certainly have. Um, when I am really serious about prayer, words are much less involved now with me than they used to be. And now it tends so much more to be having the patience to sit there and allow God to take the initiative. And I do tend to find that he he seems to work better if I'm sitting than when I'm kneeling. So, thank you for that, Lord. <laughs> um, I would like to suggest, though, that you have a particular sort of boldness in one aspect of your prayer, and that is be bold in seeking, in asking, in begging, in demanding a specific grace for this retreat. Think maybe about it. This is a very Jesuit idea, actually, you know, to, to, to seek a particular grace for each day of the retreat, or for the whole retreat. But maybe think about that, maybe pray about it. What do I want boldly to ask God to give me? What grace do I want? It may not be the one that you think that you should need, uh, but what grace do I want in this retreat? Maybe tonight, think about that and simply ask him for it boldly. And if nothing's coming to you, ask him to tell you what he most wants to give you in this retreat. You know, I, I find that when, when I'm at a quandary as to what to ask for or how to pray or whatever, I put it back on him. You know, okay, what do you want me to pray for? Um, and that leads me to kind of the last point, and that is, well, a retreat is a time of coming away. Uh, all the people who are important in our lives are not absent. So be sure that they are here with you in your prayer. And uh, that having been said, are there any questions? I'll try and, you know, I, well, you all talked for at least 10 minutes, so it actually has been only about a half hour that I've talked. I'll try to keep my talks to a half hour or, or less. And the homilies of the Mass will not be formal retreat talks. I will just be giving a few, God bless you, a few minutes of, of homiletic reflections on the, on the readings, and they may or may not tie in with anything else in the retreat. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, then, shall we wish, wish one another a good night, and, uh, and, and try not to think, try not to think too much in an organized way. I'm, I'm going to be throwing a lot of things on the wall and whatever sticks, 
and the wall of your mind. Uh, run with that. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Shall we finish with an Our Father, Hail Mary, and Glory be? Mm -hmm. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on our earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. Bless you all. Thank you. We'll see you in the morning. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs>